Hello, David Zaretsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. You know what we do here. We try to bring the Bond community together. And I've got somebody that I've been a fan of. I've been a fan of his group for a long time. It's Warren Ringham from Cue the Music. Warren, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, David. It's a real pleasure. And I've long been a fan of The Bond Experience as well. So it's a real privilege to be here today. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you. Well, let, you know what? I, let's start with the basics, because I think a lot of people in the Bond community know what Cue the Music is. But you know what? Give us in your own description. What is Cue the Music? Well, we're a tribute to the music of James Bond. And that's a, a it's a funny one, because when we call ourselves a James Bond tribute band, I think people sometimes get the wrong impression that maybe we're a, a traditional tribute band in like a, a Tom Jones tribute band or a Beatles tribute band. We're a tribute to the whole James Bond music genre. So mainly we do all the songs and we do them in a, a really kind of energetic, um, exciting way uh, and trying to be as a, uh, sort of pay as much to the original as we can, as much detail as we can. But we also do a lot of cues and chase music from the films as well. Everything from things like Bond 77 to we've done Flight into Space, um, um, capture in space or all sorts of things like that and then we also do a lot of the uh, rejected theme tunes or theme tunes that appear within the film like Dirty Love from License to Kill or Mr Kiss Kiss Bang Bang or Surrender we do those sorts of things as well so it's um it really is a wider ranging tribute to the whole series of James Bond music. That's fantastic and and I'll tell you what we're, we're going to show some excerpts at the end of this interview but Talk to us about how this began. I mean, obviously, Cue the Music had a birth of some sort. <laughs> well, like I think like most other um, Bond fan projects, it started as, with me as a fan. Um, I, I grew up with James Bond uh, on my screen. Uh, Roger Moore films were always on in, in my house. And I can remember Live and Let Die, um, the chase sequences from Live and Let Die being put on to keep me entertained when my dad was a, a trumpet player who practiced a lot and he used to put the um, live and let die chase sequences on he'd cut them together um, to kind of keep me quiet and then I remember we had A View to a Kill on VHS which my sister and I watched and played to absolute death and I remember the music in that film particularly had a real impact on me I mean we we'd learn all the all the lyrics to uh, the song um, and the, the, the John Barry cues as well that always had an influence on me. And um, growing up, my dad was a trumpet player that played on lots of soundtracks with, he did some stuff with John Williams and he even did some recordings with John Barry. So I was always exposed to that sort of, um, that film uh, and soundtrack, um, you know, that, that kind of whole kind of, uh, thing I was always exposed to it growing up and so I was always into film music particularly growing up and then as I kind of graduated from music college and I formed my own function band which played at parties birthdays and weddings and corporate events um, it started to occur to me that nobody had ever done like a James Bond band to play at that sort of thing and then I set about how do I recreate this music from what is basically an 80 piece orchestra and recreate it with a band that can take it out and on the road to smaller events. Um, and that was that was quite a challenging thing to do to start with, because it meant that we had to make the band. There was no way we could do it with a traditional sized function band, which would be kind of eight, nine, ten. It was always going to have to be bigger. And, and, and in the end, we ended up with a standard size of 13, which is large. Um, but it, but that lineup did allow me to recreate the sound of the songs and quite a few of the cues uh, without really losing a lot of quality. And from there, to kind of promote the band, we recorded demo videos and put them on YouTube. And I think the first batch of videos that we, we put out sort of 12, 15 years ago accumulated about a million views with sort of mainly Bond fans, which was amazing. Um, and and just was just so popular with Bond fans. And eventually we had so many requests to, to come and see us that we decided to try and put that into theatres. And, um, you know, having survived the early theatre shows, which were really, really tough, where we didn't sell many tickets, um, we just grew and grew from there. And, and the last couple of years has just been unbelievable. Some of the uh, some of the things that we've done, I don't know if you want me to 
to go through some a couple of those things that we've done. It, it was actually one of my questions. Tell tell me about some of the highlights for sure. Well, I mean, it's like a Bond fan's dream. I mean, um, first of all, it, it, the kind of the big thing that started off was um, a guy called Terry Bamba, who's a, a you know a big character from the from the series. He was a production manager and worked on seven of the Bond films, and he. He became a huge fan of ours about five or six years ago and and started really kind of championing our cause. And he booked us for his parents. I think it was Diamond or Golden Diamond uh, Jubilee, Wedding Diamond Jubilee, um, where they, he had invited quite a few people that were, you know, sort of in and around um, the Bond community. And that sort of really did put us on the map. And then the next thing from there that happened was that we played at the On The Tracks 007 uh, on the tracks of 007 events the night before the uh, Spectre premiere mm -hmm. so that really um that really gave us the sort of uh chance to play in front of a lot of Bond fans big big, big amount of pressure um by the way I've got it I've got to interrupt you for a second because um I went to you know I was there for the Spectre premiere in London and I couldn't make it out to your event all I heard the next day was about your band. That's all I heard was, oh, you know, cue the music and cue the music. And a lot of people were saying things like, you know, I hated this song. I've always hated it. I skipped it on the tracks. But when they played it, I got goosebumps. I mean, that was the big discussion. Do you know, I mean, that's something that obviously I've, I've heard people say a lot of the time. And, and the words that, that it's, it's, it's almost embarrassing to say it, but the words that, that, you, that you hear is, well, I liked it better than the original. And I mean, that wasn't I would never say that that was my aim, because the last thing as a as a Bond fan and someone that's basically paying tribute to music. I mean, we're just take, trying to take it to new audiences and, and trying to keep the, the whole thing alive. The last thing you're trying to do is sort of upstage uh, the originals or, or, or anything like that. But it's I mean, it's, it's unbelievable when you hear people say that it's it, it's kind of like the, the most incredible compliment that anyone can pay to you. It's it's better than saying, wow, that's amazing. If somebody says that, it, it's it's just an unbelievable feeling when they do say that. But but no, I mean, so that event, that really sort of um, that was an opportunity to, to to show people what we we're about. And I'd always believed, you know, it's it was a sort of really long struggle to that point. But I'd always believed in what we were doing. And I knew that if people saw it, they would like it. But it was just getting getting it in front of people that was difficult, you know, People were never really going to come out of their own accord. But thanks to the confidence that Martin Mulder uh, showed in, in us by booking us for that, it gave us that sort of platform. And then from there, we did the Bond Stars event next, which we played at, which was um, a tribute to the work of Peter Lamont, who, of course, mm -hmm. worked on more Bond films than anybody. Um, and there were lots and lots of people there that, that got to see us. Um, and we made really good friends that night with people like Madeline Smith and Caroline Monroe and some of the former cast and crew. So, you know, this was all kind of just going in this this sort of um, upward trajectory. And then from that, we were invited to perform at Sir Roger Moore's Memorial at Pinewood in 2017, which wow. was just, you know, the, the most incredible thing ever. Um, and we had, to, I mean, I kept it quiet for for. I think it was nearly six months, certainly months anyway, that we we knew we were doing it. And nobody ever said to me, you can't tell anyone. But I but I I appreciated that that was a conf probably a confidential thing and we would treat it as such. And um, so it literally and we didn't until the night we'd actually done it. We hadn't told anybody about it. Nothing on Facebook, nothing. So God, imagine trying to keep that a secret for for months. And it was uh, such an emotional day. Um, it was it was a weird feeling for for me because we were there obviously to perform and and in a way I guess we you could say we were there to work and, and we had to deliver and it was a lot of pressure on on me I felt a lot of pressure that day to deliver because um, you know that it meant so much to the people that were there it was for basically for his friends and his family it was a a relatively small gathering of sort of two three hundred people. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of tears and a lot of laughter and a, a lot of happy memories and fond memories of, of, of Sir Roger Moore. And I kind of felt, I've always said it, I, I kind of felt that we were there or I was there representing the fans that weren't able to be there because I'd grown up with him on my screen. I was 
just a massive Bond fan. So it was like it was our kind of opportunity to to say thank you from all the fans. And and that's the great thing about music. It's so powerful. It, it does give you that opportunity to to do that. So anyway, so we did we did that an amazing day. Um, and then probably the next greatest thing for us as Bond fans was this year at the Honor Majesty Secret Service 50th anniversary event at His Gloria. Yeah. Um, we were asked if we would go and do a two hour show as part of the celebrations. And George Lazenby was there and John Glenn and Vic Armstrong. And, wow. And we got we got to have a good chat with with George for about 15 minutes. He was telling us about how he played bass in a band and yeah, just just incredible. I mean, the, the most incredible experience of my life, apart from my children being born, it was just the most incredible weekend uh, and the most incredible feelings that I've ever experienced the whole weekend. It was just you, so unique. It will never be repeated. I, I've got to tell you from, a, from an outsider's standpoint, my quick little story, um, and I think you'll like it, so bear with me. So first of all, you were fantastic because you were giving the world that couldn't be there a little bit of a, a backstage story. You know, you were, you, were, you were filming as you were setting up. You were filming with all the issues, you know, the gravity issues, people getting sick. I mean, it really was like a journey. And I felt like from a social media standpoint, you were doing such a wonderful job as a Sherpa, taking us through this journey that you were on. So I never felt like I wasn't there. Then obviously there were little excerpts oh, wow. from other people. Oh yeah, you did a great job. Then there were excerpts from other people, but again, I'll give you a perfect example of the impact that you've made throughout the globe. Um, the very next day, Joe Darlington got in touch with me, uh, being James Bond, and he was gushing. And he said, David, you know, um, he spent about a week with George, so that was a big deal. I love this. The people were great. He said, the only time that I really got emotional, I mean, really got emotional, was with Cue the Music. And he said that the, the sounds and the music, he goes, there's nothing you could even imagine. And he said, what happened was he was upstairs, I guess, and the band started and it just reverberated through Pitt's Gloria. And he's like, he was drawn. He was playing a casino game. He knows exactly where he was. And he was drawn down and just everybody was mesmerized watching this thing. And I think mm. that's part of the impact. You, you really do draw in the Bond fan. Well, uh, thank you. I'll tell you a couple of things about that, actually. And I... I think the whole thing is set up to be, I've always been aware of what music can do emotionally. And um, as a trumpet player myself, I, I was, I, I've always really channeled my emotion into the trumpet. And I think that's something that I've, I've, I've been really careful when we've, we've put musicians that, uh, that play in the band. I've made sure that they have that same feeling as well. I mean, one of the things that I always make sure is that the musicians that we that we have are guys that put in 110 percent there's a thing with performing i suppose it's i don't know whether it's the same with sportsmen but certainly with musicians that you can go at sort of 90 you can go 100 percent of your ability and then you've got that risk factor if you're going at it flat out that you might make a mistake or you might overcook something and, and you know have a an accident on the on the brass for example it might be a split like a, a split note where you crack a note and it you know mm. um or you know if you're a singer i guess your voice might crack if you're over over going for it so a lot of what time what happens is in a, in a performance what they'll do is they'll kind of just take that little edge off they'll take five or ten percent off for safety so you've got that little margin of error and that's just not how we we run in cuny music we go a hundred percent whole all of the time and so the consequence is you get this amazing adrenaline fueled performance that everybody feels when you're in the room and it doesn't really it you can't come across um in the videos i'm sure it comes across a bit but everybody says oh my god it's just, just so much better in person and and it's great in in the videos and i am um, kerry was actually singing um writings on the wall on a show a couple of weeks ago not piz gloria but a different show and um during the performance towards the end of the song her voice cracked slightly you know on one of the notes and i thought it was like the first time in 15 years i'd ever heard her voice go and i thought blimey she, you know she must be tired i've never this is on what's going on you know this right. never happens so i caught her afterwards and said hey what, what happened tonight were you a bit um uh, were, were you were you struggling tonight you know was it was this just struggling with your throat or anything like that she said no 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 it wasn't that at all she said 
you said it was the emotion she said i was I was riding the emotion so flat out, like she did, because she she says when she's singing, she she tries to tell a story, you know, and, and quite often at the end of things like License to Kill and Writings on the Wall or whatever, she will well up and 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 the tears will start to come and she'll sort of you know gather herself and and it's fine, but she said she just let it get away just a bit oh. too much and she said and and her voice cracked. She said because she was just on the verge of of you know of of going over that top with the emotion, and I thought wow, you know that 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 just sort of really sums up the whole thing with key the music is you know is and somebody somebody at piz gloria said to me afterwards um she's got you guys really know how to pull on the heartstrings and i thought well that's so cool that you recognize that because that is exactly you know what it's about i mean everything from from every uh, angle of what we do is about delivering the most passionate performance of bond music for yeah. bond fans like i when I, start, when I created the show, I thought, you know, what would I want? If I was going to see a Bond concert, what would I want to see? Right. And that's never out of my mind, really. Um, I think when you go and see, I've seen other Bond concerts, and I think it's a lot of the time, and it's not a criticism, it's just the fact, you know, that for those guys, a lot of the time, you know, they might be doing a Beethoven symphony the night before and, a, I don't know, something else the night after. And Bond's an, a, just a, a date in the diary. And I'm not saying they don't give it everything, but for us, this is what we live and breathe. And um, it, it, it means everything to us. And, and it's, it's, you know, every part of the show is created to deliver for a Bond fan what I know that they want to hear and see. What I've heard a lot of people say about Cue the Music is it is that much more special because it's for fans by fans. You can hire a band, yeah. like you said, that was doing Beethoven the night before and Les Mis the night before that. There's something that courses through your vein and you're going to try that much harder. You're going to be more empathetic to the listener. Yeah. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that through Cue the Music, you've become a multimillionaire, haven't you? <laughs> No, I wish. Let's I talk wish about I... that. What, what, what? Tell me about the the financial side of things. Well, it's so I. Well, I basically it's it's down to me really. Um, um Cuny has been a fifteen year project of mine that has really been a passion project that I've been able to uh, run on the side of being a professional musician. Um, and it's it is a full time job really. Um, I, I I work about hundred hours a week between being a trumpet player as a full-time musician and doing cue the music and often work through the night doing the admin and stuff like that. Because I mean, every part of cue the music I do, I build the website, I do the marketing, I do all the accounting, I do the audio mixing of everything you see on YouTube. I do all the video mixing. I do all the arranging. I book the musicians. I MD it. I have to find time to, to keep my trumpet playing going. Uh, I drive the equipment to the, to the gig. I set up the equipment. I'm one of the sound engineers that, that, that sets it up and packs it down as well. Um, I do the poster designs now for the theatres. I organise getting them printed. Uh, there's other things that I'm missing off, but you know that, that every aspect of the music is is really is is done by me. And the thing is, with its with its sort of um, being such high high level, such high quality, um, that comes at a price, you know. And there's a big band. It's one of the most expensive touring theatre shows um, in, in kind of provincial theatres around the UK. Um, it's one of the most expensive to run. And um, uh, so, yeah, it's unfortunately that, that comes down to, to me to sort of make sure that those bills are paid. And it's yeah. it's it's hard. It's really, really hard. And there, there's been so many times I've thought, there's been so many times when I thought that we've uh, we, we're not going to make it, that we're going to have to um, to cancel the show and and stuff. And even now, it's, it's you know it's a daily kind of look at the figures and see can we keep it going and stuff. So it's it's tough. It really is. Um, yeah. And I bring it up okay, because you know one of the things that I think um, you know people need to hear, and and my followers and other people need to hear, is that you know these types of things take away your time because time is money. Let's yeah. let's put your time aside. There is a lot of financial investment that people put into these passion projects. But one of the things that I love that you did, and I, I'm a real big believer in this, is you put together a uh, Patreon page, a Patreon experience, if you will. And with a lot of Patreon yeah. pages, um, very often it is, please give us 
You didn't do that. You said, this is going to be wonderfully experiential and transactional. So don't just give us the support and the investment. We're going to give something very special back to us. Walk me through the thinking around doing that. Well, the thing is, is that the, the first and foremost, being honest with you, Patreon will give us sort of a, um, a monthly turnover that can help with you know the ongoing costs of the of the of the show. But the other thing as well is that I mean, people keep sort of saying to me, "Oh, why aren't you?" Because the what we're doing, we're releasing the Piers Gloria recording, and we're also doing a 2019 recording through Patreon. And people say, "Oh, I want to buy a CD." But the trouble with the CD is that the way that the, the music business has changed, there's, there's no money in CDs and, and mm. downloads and streams and stuff like that. There's just nothing in it. I mean, on a on a sort of $20, £15 CD, I, I end up with about 35, if, if that percent, that we actually end up getting back to the band. And that's not including the costs of actually recording the CD or producing it. I'm just talking about the point of sale cost that we lose. VAT, we lose the, the cost of printing the CD, we lose PRS, we lose some of the web. If we, if we sell it through the website, the website take a percentage. If you mm. pay with PayPal, they take a percentage. If you pay with credit card, they take a percentage. By the time you end up with the, the, the money left over at the end, it's so small that the last CD we did three years ago, we still have to sell another, I think it was 500 CDs just to break even. And that's without paying any musicians anything for their time on the CD. So the idea with Patreon is that um, we're doing it as downloads and and at the end of it, we will um, give those patrons that are on certain levels, we'll give them a physical CD. They only have to pay the postage to get it to them. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of extra stuff that we're doing on there. We're doing commentaries. We're going to do some really interesting things with that, with with kind of telling people how we're producing these sounds. and. Things like the Unimagined Secret Service medley that we did. It was a 20 minute medley of cues mm. from the film at Piers Gloria, which was just the most ambitious thing that we've ever done to take. I mean, you kind of list all the things that 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 kind of um, make up that whole that whole thing. And you think, crikey, what were you thinking? I mean, we were playing music that had never been performed live in 50 years in the location that it was written for in Piers Gloria with cast and crew, including George Lazenby present, in front of the most knowing, diehard, potentially critical fans that there are in the world. We did it with no rehearsal time apart from the time that we had in the afternoon. And halfway through our rehearsal of it, we were stopped because the press interviews with the cast and crew were starting up and they said, sorry, you're going to have to stop playing because you're making too much noise. And then 20 minutes of solid music um, is, is, is not easy anyway, you see, and it was all different tempos and we were taking orchestral cues and re reproducing it with a 13-piece band and there was all sorts of tricks and, and um, doubling and things that we had to do to pull that off and it's, uh, when we released the commentary on that, I think people are going to be absolutely just fascinated to know how we did it and I, and I tell you what, if you A, B, um, the recording that we did to the original recording, like you compare the two, Mm -hmm. I, I, it's not much in it. I was doing it last night. And I was pretty proud of it. I mean, you, you know, I think we did a, a really stand up job of reproducing that that sound. It was amazing. Ab absolutely amazing. And, and one of the things we're going to do is we're going to put the link up to the Patreon page below so everybody can take a look at that, see what the different levels are. Um, there are minimum commitments in there. If you just, you know, if something touched you in this video and, and what Warren was talking about, all the way through to, you know, funding uh, a private jet. No, there isn't anything like that. We should have <laughs> something in there. So, so Warren, let me, last question. And it's, it's kind of a big question. And I didn't prepare you for this. I want everybody to know. Um, if you had a magic wand, let's, let's call it the big dream. Where would you want to take cue the music? Um, do you know what? That, let me answer that in two parts because I guess I'm in a situation now where I'm kind of reevaluating that question because when I started out, I think my ambition was being honest with you in this because this one won't ever happen, I don't think. But my ambition was always to play at a premiere of one of the Bond films. Now, for various reasons, I think that's unlikely. But do you know what? To do the Roger Moore event and to do the Piz, the Piz Gorio on a Secret Service event, that 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 has just been that's just been a dream come true. Um, 
I mean, I do have to pinch myself. I and mean, when we've got we've got um, now on our kind of uh, promotional material, we've got quotes from Sir Roger Moore's office from George Lazenby. And we got a, an amazing review from The Times, which is, you know, the one of the biggest pa- newspapers in, in the UK. We got an amazing uh, uh, review from The Times. And it's I have to pinch myself with that, you know, and I kind of think, well, I've achieved everything that I could possibly have wanted to achieve when I started. I think the only things left that I'd like to do um, that really kind of drive me um, that, that I really would like to achieve is that we've had so many inquiries from the Middle East um, to go and do events out there. And for whatever reason, we've never managed to quite get it over the line. We did one in the Maldives uh, a couple of years ago, which was cool. Um, but for some reason, the Dubai and that, that, so that's just something that I would like to just get off my um, that, that monkey. I'd like to get off my back. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and the other one that, that I would love to do. And it's just so difficult that it, it possibly will never happen. But we would love to come and perform in the US at some point. And people are always asking about that. When are you coming? When are you coming? When are you coming? It's not that we don't want to. Believe me, we'd be on the first plane over if we could. But it's the the costs to get us over there are so astronomical. Um, the main sort of the two things that are sort of prohibitively expensive are the flights and the visas. Mm. Um, the visas potentially cost more than the flights themselves. And the flights you're looking at fifteen hundred dollars per person, probably. So wow. 13 piece band plus my engineer, 14 people. You know, I mean, I've, I've sort of put together rough quotes of, of what it would cost to do one a one off show in, in the US. And I would I would say it's probably going to be in the region of somewhere of 60 to 80 thousand dollars. You know, right. crazy amounts of money. So it's it's almost an unachievable wish in some ways. Uh, that, but that's probably the, the thing. And uh, and also, I guess we want to just make our tour in the UK uh, as successful as we can and, you know, not have to. I, I would love to do theatre shows without having to do, um, have a sleepless night before and afterwards with, uh, you know, with the tickets and stuff, because we have shows where we do really well and we have shows where we really struggle. And for the show to keep going, we, we need to have a turnover of shows where um, we, we can regularly go out and, and at least break even with them. Because okay. if the number of shows drop, then the attraction to my musicians drops and they go off to do other projects that they know that there's going to, sort of pay them an income and and also if you're not doing very many then the standard drops because people aren't doing it that often and um it, it's sort of all about economies of scale as with any business and it's um so yeah that this those are the sort of two or three things really is to is to have a show that's sort of regularly going out in the uk and, and being supported and is sustainable and yeah one day we'd love to bring it bring it over to your side and to your neck of the woods and I know that there's lots of people out there that, that are dotted around the US and that's part of the issue is that we've got a lot of followers in the US, but they're dotted out. And as you know, it's it's well, you know better than me, but it's such a massive, massive country that it's it's almost impossible for us to pick one location and um, and cover all the bases. You know, it's uh, and even one location, is, as, as I mentioned, is, is so expensive. It's 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 tough, but we'll keep on dreaming and you never know one day it might happen. I would love that. I mean, very selfishly, I can almost imagine rather than come over for just one event is to literally have, you know, cue the music, the U.S. tour, you know, where you start in New York and you kind of work the East Coast and then you dot over to, you know, the Midwest and then you wind up in California and the West Coast. And uh, who knows, from there you can go to Hawaii and Japan. Wow. Wouldn't that be amazing? We just need we just need a, a, a someone with. Um that loves the band and can afford to back it. That's <laughs> if right. You're out there, give us a call. <laughs> oh, we have we have those people. We have people everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Lauren, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your time. I know you're incredibly busy with everything going on and juggling all the balls. Um, the other thing is, thank you for doing what you're doing. Um, I know that 90% of why you do this is through the passion of a fan, and you brought us some incredible moments and i know you'll continue to do that we're going to put a ton of links including where you're playing below so people can stalk you and follow you appropriately but thanks for being on today 
No, thank you. And thank you for everyone that's watching that does already follow us. And, and just another shout out for the Patreon scheme. It is a great place that you can support the show and help keep us going. But actually, more important for you because there's so many great, there's so many great downloads on there. Every single month, we're giving away so much great content. And it's not just the track. It's all the stuff that comes with it. Isolated audio so you can hear what different parts of the band are doing. It's really, really interesting. If you're into Bond music, it's the place to be. Patreon. Perfect. Really, really good summation. So this has been Warren and David Zaritsky for the Bond Experience, and we will see you all very soon. Take care. Cheers. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.